In this video lecture, we're going to go over some technical details and tie up some loose ends from symbolization. Now, you don't have to worry too much about this in that if you've been following the way I've been symbolizing from videos one and two, you don't actually need anything in this video to symbolize any of the expressions that we're going to be doing in this course. However, rounding out the details and really sort of just tying up all the loose ends is going to be helpful in the future for our understanding and particularly will play a useful role when we move to predicate logic semantics. The first thing we're going to look at are special properties of binary predicates. Binary predicates are predicates that have two places. And so there's three very well-known binary predicate properties, and those are symmetry, transitivity, and reflexivity. These properties can all be written out in logical code, like so. But really, the key to understanding these properties is just to have a good example of something that is the property and a good example of something that isn't the property. So for symmetric, a predicate is only symmetric if everything that stands in the relation of the predicate stands in the opposite relation as well. So most things actually aren't symmetric, like love, for example. If A loves B, it's not necessarily the case that B loves A. But other things are, like, say, touching. If A is touching B, then I'm pretty sure that B has to be touching A. And so uh, touching is a symmetric relation. The next property is transitivity. Transitivity is something we're very familiar with in terms of a well ordering. So if A is taller than B and B is taller than C, then A is taller than C. So taller than is a transitive relation. Now, of course, uh, just like our previous example, love, love is not transitive. If A loves B and B loves C, it's not necessarily the case that A loves C. Now, notice that it could be the case if something is non-transitive, uh, it could be the case that it actually holds. But what it means is it doesn't necessarily hold in all cases. The last predicate property we're looking at is reflexivity. Reflexivity is sort of an odd one. It basically says a predicate is reflexive if everything stands in the relation to itself. Now there aren't that many sort of obvious natural language examples. They all sort of rely on some sort of uh, sort of trick with identity. So for example, I could say uh, the same color as. If that property, if that predicate exists, then I could say A is the same color as A. And by definition, actually, everything will stand in that relation to itself. So the predicate the same color as is reflexive. Uh, is love reflexive? Well, is it true that everyone loves themselves? Well, you'd sort of hope so, but it might not be the case. So love might not necessarily be reflexive. And so we say it's an irreflexive property. For our purposes, it's important to know that you should never assume that a binary predicate has any of these properties. Even if it's sort of intuitively obvious, say, being married to or being the spouse of, you shouldn't assume, for example, that those are symmetric. You really just want to treat the predicate as an English language sentence uh, and not actually add in anything that we think we know about the predicate to the sentence itself. So unless explicitly stated, never assume that a binary predicate is symmetric, transitive, or reflexive. These properties are going to be somewhat helpful when we move into modeling and interpretations in predicate logic. Uh, semantics, so you really want to know them. The best thing to know is just have an example at your fingertips of something that is symmetric, reflexive, or transitive, and something that's not. The final question you might sort of ask is, is there a binary predicate that is actually all three of these properties, such that it is transitive, symmetric, and reflexive? Uh, in fact, there are. There are lots, but most of them are sort of artificially created, especially in fields like mathematics. The most natural uh, predicate that we have that is all these three uh, properties is actually equality. And it doesn't seem to me that there's another sort of candidate for a natural language example of something that's all three. One question that I really haven't gone over, and I've often tried to avoid, is whether or not you can pull all your quantifiers to the front of a sentence. So if we look at these two sentences, they seem the same. There's an existential, universal, existential. But in the first case, they're sort of nested within the sentence itself, and in the second case, all the quantifiers are pulled out to the front. So are these logically equivalent? Actually, the answer is yes, and we could prove this by proving a biconditional th uh, theorem between the two. But in general, the question is, can it always be done that I can pull out the quantifiers to the front and not change the meaning of the sentence? Now, to answer that, we actually have to look at some specific rules that deal with this, which are called confinement rules. Confinement rules address when I can extend the scope of a quantifier over to a larger part of the sentence. So here are the confinement rules for conjunctions and disjunctions, both, uh, both of them for the uh, existential as well as the universal. Now, the confinement rule for conditionals and disjunctions is very straightforward. It says there are no problems. 
if you have a quantifier that is only modifying one conjunct or one disjunct, you can actually extend the scope of that quantifier over the entire conjunction or disjunction, and you won't have any problems. So ripping out the quantifier in this sense is okay. Now, of course, there's a restriction here, and this restriction is the classic restrainment uh, restriction of containment. So alpha here cannot appear free in phi. You can't actually sort of capture too much here when you're extending the scope. Um, we're not going to worry about this. You can revisit the universal uh, derivation and the existential generalization video for uh, the rules about capturing and containment. So here's an example of how we use confinement for conjunction and disjunction. In this example, you can see that what I've done is I've taken the universal y, which only operates over my right conjunct, and I've extended it over the scope of the entire sentence. And in this case now, these two sentences are logically equivalent. So what about conditionals? Well, conditionals is actually a bit tricky. If the quantifier that you want to extend the scope of actually falls in the consequent, there are no issues. You can just totally move that quantifier from only modifying the consequent and extend the scope to the entire conditional, and you don't need to worry about anything. That just works no problem. So in this example, I did that. I took the universal x and extended it to over the scope of the entire sentence. But it's different when we actually have the quantifier in the antecedent. When the quantifier is in the antecedent, I actually have to flip the quantifier when I pull it over the scope. And so this seems a bit odd, but you can sort of see why that we would need to do this. If we look at this sentence, the left side of the sentence has as the antecedent, there exists a y, a, y. So this is really saying if there is, exists an a. But if I actually extend that existential over the entire scope, I get some sentence that's not quite saying the same thing. For me to say, if there is an A, I would actually need to change that to a universal. So it says, for anything, if it's an A. And that's why we actually need to flip the quantifier. What about biconditionals? Well, biconditionals, there are no particular rules. What we do is we reduce a biconditional into conditionals joined by conjunction. And then when we do that, we actually just use the rules of confinement for conjunctions, disjunctions, as well as conditionals. And that's how we navigate the biconditional. With our confinement rules, we can now put our sentences into something called prenex form, or something called, sometimes called prenex normal form. In prenex form, all quantifiers are stacked up at the front, and then we have a clean symbolic sentence afterwards with no more quantifiers. Each quantifier has a different letter so that there's no ambiguity about which quantifies what, and there are no biconditionals at all. We've split biconditionals into conjunctions with uh, conditionals as well. Let's look at a quick example of how we would move to prenex form. So here we have a sentence, but I notice that there are some initial problems with it right off the bat. In fact, the first problem is actually that I have uh, x as my variable that's bound twice. Now this is actually not a problem in the sentence I've expressed right now because the x scope is restricted. But if I want to extend the scope over to everything, the first thing I could can do here is to change my uh, letter from x to say z. Now it doesn't really matter here, I chose the universal to change, I could have chose the existential, but either way now I don't have letter confusion. Another issue is that you should see that I have for all y on the end there, but it's actually the negation of all y. Well that's not a big deal, I can use my quantifier negation rule to flip that so the quantifier is actually in front. Now I'm ready to use my confinement rules. And so the first thing I'm going to do is actually extend the scope of my existential from my antecedent over the entire sentence. Now this flips the quantifier, so that's why I changed to universal. The rest of the pulling out of the quantifiers is not that difficult. Uh, I'm pulling the universal z from the left disjunct to the entire disjunction, which is actually the consequent, and then I'll do the exact same thing for the there exists y. And now the last two moves, I pull those out from the consequent to modify the entire sentence, and there you go. This is the prenex normal form of my original sentence, and they are logically equivalent. Now you might have noticed something. If you tried this on your own, you might have actually ended up with something slightly different. You might have gotten something, say, in this order, or in a different order. And the reason why is I actually just sort of randomly decided to start with the antecedent, and that's how come I got the for all x as my furthest out quantifier. But what if I had actually started modifying my consequent first? Then I might have gotten something in a different order. And so the question is, does the order of the quantifiers actually matter? Well, 
In a purely monadic sentence, so when there's only one place predicates, it turns out that the order of the quantifiers never matters. And the reason why is because nothing is ever relating to one another, so that doesn't cause any quantifier confusion in terms of ambiguity. So if we want to move things into prenext normal form, it's totally safe to do with a monadic sentence. But in multi-place predicates, we learn that this is a different story. There's a very large difference between saying that for all things relates to something and something relates to for all things. And it's when we have multiplace that we have this relationship. So in multiplace predicates, actually moving to prenext form isn't so nice. You really need to worry about the order of the quantifiers and the meaning, and there is no sort of obvious algorithmic path to getting the right form. What's the moral of the story? Well, the moral is in general, can you do this? Uh, and the answer is no. You can't, in general, easily just rip out your quantifiers without thinking and have a sentence where all the quantifiers are stacked at the front. You need to pay careful attention to your confinement rules, and you really also need to see if you've altered the meaning if you're using multiplace predicates. So why would you ever want to do this? Well, it turns out that mathematicians and computer scientists really like prenex form. Mathematicians, I think, like it just because it's aesthetically pleasing. They like the way it looks. Uh, whereas computer scientists like it for a practical reason. It is somewhat easier to code programming if all your quantifiers are at the front, and so your coding doesn't need to look for further quantifiers within the sentence. Uh, the problem is both mathematicians and computer scientists often just think that you can put the quantifiers at the front without having any problems come up, uh, but in fact now we see you do need to pay attention. So why don't we do this in our logic class? Well, actually, prenext form is quite divorced from a natural language understanding of uh, our language and logic. And it's sort of an unnatural way of expressing certain things that we say and how we think. So the natural way to symbolize if we found, uh, sorry, ground logic in natural language is to not do prenext form at all. And we only open scopes when we need them and close scopes when we're done with them. And in that way, we never have to worry about these confinement rules. And it's the way we've been doing it all along. The last puzzle that I'd like to address is something that you probably haven't thought about in a long time. And it's a pretty simple question. If I want to symbolize the present king of France is bald, how do I do that? Well, this is pretty straightforward. A is my name letter for the present king of France, and B is my predicate for bald. And so I just symbolize it as BA. But why don't I actually symbolize it like so? There exists an A, B of A. Or there exists an X, B of X. Sorry, B of A. Now, the second form is actually just flat out wrong according to our logical notation. We are not allowed to quantify over anything other than a variable letter i through z. But what about the third form? I here say that it's incorrect, but it's actually not technically true. If I know that the present king of France is bald, surely I can existentially generalize and conclude there is something and the present king of France is bald. And that's what I've done in the last one. But why don't I do this in general? Why am I using this odd example? Well, let's take a closer look. So Bertrand Russell is famous for asking the question, the statement, the present king of France is bald, is that true or is it false? Now in his time and in our time, that statement is definitely false. And so we could ask, oh, well, if that statement is false, then it must be the case that not BA is true. Because if BA is false, then BA must be, uh, not BA must be true, which means that we actually end up with a weird statement. We end up with the statement that the pre present king of France is actually not bald. But that seems wrong. Because both for Russell and for us, we know that the reason why the present king of France is bald is actually false is because there's no such thing as the present king of France. What Russell realized was that there must be some sort of interpretation whenever we use a name with a predicate. So if I say the present king of France is bald, I'm actually asserting three different things. The first is that there is something that's the present king of France. The second is that there's only one thing. Names are supposed to be unique identifiers. And then finally I can say, well, that thing is then bald. So when I actually ask, why is the statement the present king of France is bald false? It's not because of him being bald or not bald. It's actually just because the first thing that I seem to be asserting is that there exists something that is the present king of France, and that is actually what makes it false. If we use the Rousselian interpretation of names, it explains why we don't existentially quantify whenever we actually introduce a name letter. It's because part of the name letter is the implicit assertion that that thing exists. Okay, that's it for the technical details. I hope this ties up some loose ends for you and sort of makes sense in tidying up our uh, symbolic system. 
Um, no, again, none of these skills are really that necessarily important for you succeeding in symbolization, but they are nice to know going forward into semantics.